Well, it's welcome to the Totally Awesome Fishing Show again. If I look somewhat windswept, it is because, yes, I am. It's extremely windy. I'm down here on the coast, back in Somerset, and I'm staying at St. Audrey's Bay Holiday Park. Two, three bedrooms. I think they've got you know, units as well, which have got chalets, they've got a swimming pool, they've got a bar. What more could you want? I'll tell you what else you could want. If you're a fisherman, you want some of that down there, don't you? That's it, Bristol Channel. So good fishing down there. I'm gonna give it a go fishing. I do have the wife and the daughter with me, but they were disappearing off in the car, shopping or whatever we do. Well, that's all they do. That's all they do do, shop. I'm gonna be saving money. But the reason I also like it down here is because I've got two options. And here at St. Aubrey's Bay, where they, you know, have a high rise and fall in the tide, is I've got two shots. I've got a high water mark, which is so convenient, down some cliff steps, which you go down the cliff steps from the Holiday Park, down the steps, right in front of almost of, of where you're staying, the residential caravans and the chalets, straight under the beach. You can fish somewhere like two hours up, two hours down. Now, being the Bristol Channel, it goes out a very long way. Now, I'm not going to walk out here because at the moment I've got a little spot that the sound should be okay. But also, I'm going to show you just over there, if you guys can see that over there, there is a reef. Now, that is a really, really good low water mark. But if you go out there just before low water and fish, you have to be so careful about getting cut off behind you. For that reason, you would need something like a guide or a local. Craig Butler's a local fishing guide in this area. He's coming down to fish with me for a couple of hours tonight. We're gonna to be fishing the high water mark here. That's an Audrey, just down those steps I told you about. But over there on the reef, it's a good fishing. I would not entertain fishing that on my own, to be honest, and absolutely no way in the dark. So I do not want to get cut off as a nun swimmer. It's a one-way ticket at Davy Jones's locker. But anyway, let me show you a bit more about the reef and the beach area. And that beach area is, at a low tide, absolutely monumental. Look at the size of those people as I pull back on the camera and you can see how far that tide's gone out. And that me, well, that, that might not even be the lowest point on the day I was filming. And here you can see the cliffs, which are covered in beautiful greenery. And when you look back, all those ridges are covered in weed. There's plenty of food there for fish. All of that water looks coloured. Very, very deceiving down here. They do get some good fish. Now there you can see, that it's a sort of strange, it's not a clay rock, I don't actually know what it is, but you can see a smooth area in the front there. And way in the distance, you've got the reefy type areas. Now, it depends where you want to fish. You could, you, there's nothing to stop you look going out there fishing the rough areas, but you're gonna lose gear. And this is it, looking at the same beach through a viewfinder on the other side. And you can see beautiful red cliffs and you look at the sloping strata, it's at 45 degrees there, where it's all lifted up evolutionarily millions of years ago. And that rocky, reefy area, look at the size of the people down there, I'm not sure they've got fishing ones. I pull back and you can see it very, very tempting to fish down on that point, but you could get cut off. On the other thing, the wind was horrific, only loved by this immature herring gull who hangs in a 30 knot wind without even flapping his wings. Anyway, my next step was getting down to the beach. I've climbed down the cliffs using these uh, steps. I'm trying to shield the mic here. It's absolutely howling, it must be about force five. You can see it zigzags all the way down, back and forth, down these red cliffs, and they come out down there. Somebody's built themselves a little shelter there. And Craig said he's coming down. Look at the formations in there. Some of these have collapsed. I hope it's not going to collapse on me this afternoon stroke this evening. We've got three and a half hours of fishing here. That would make a nice piece of kindling wood for a bonfire, wouldn't it, that one? I'll throw my baits out there. I've got braid on the right hand one, the big grip lead. That's got a whole a bit, a sort of joey size small mackerel on there. I thought there might be a chance of a big fish. Um, and the other one has got double sanded sandals bound together with uh, bait thread. But they're fresh frozen sandals. So fingers crossed, something comes along. This is the sort of time, uh, people, when you do actually, I'm just going to try and shield this mic. When you do actually pick up the odd big fish, I don't seem to, I really don't seem to catch any big fish down here at all. But I enjoy my beach fishing. It's wild. Now tomorrow, OMG, 
they give so much rain coming in that I fully expect if I fish here to find Noah's Ark out there and I'll probably get him with my grip lead. So a lot of this might be a bit unstable with the water coming off. It really is a really nice evening here, but my goodness me, you can see it is absolutely ripping all the way along there. That goes way up in the Bristol Channel there. Welsh Wells over there. That straight out there, I try and hold it dead still in this wind, which is difficult. Straight out there is the open ocean, Atlantic Ocean. Over there is Minehead. Over there where we've done both beach and boat fishing. And fingers crossed, Listen, I've just, I've just given it a go tonight, guys, to be honest. The girls have done their shopping, they're back in there. They're looking forward to this rainy weather. You know why? Because they know the old boy's not fishing. If he's not fishing, there's a good chance he's going to ferry them around like some sort of cheap taxi. And it's not cheap because it costs me money because they go in all to the shops. They've got nothing else to do with the rain except. That's right, you know what women are? They shop in the rain. It's not good for men. I have actually got a couple more tides I might be able to fish. Tomorrow is a total no-no. The next uh, tide will be, what would it be like, 24 hours away. I might be able to get one more evening session in because a high tide here, I think I, I told you earlier, you've got the low tide mark, you've got the high tide marks. So say two up, two down, or two up, half an hour, two down, um, is, is sort of all you're going to get here. It's when the fish move in close. Well, I hope that lot's not coming down. Now I've actually fished another beach called Strangles, I think it's in North Devon, where I saw a huge, in fact I heard it first, massive amount of rockfall that nearly killed some people, crashed them there about 300 yards away, it's just a big rumbling noise that came crashing down. So I'm always a little bit wary of, you know, standing underneath those cliffs. And here you can see the coloured water, you can see the weed along the, uh, along the wave line there. Don't be put off by the absolutely mud colour of the water because that's what they need in the Bristol Channel to get those fish feeding. And by golly, they do have some good fish down there. And there's a lot, a lot of weed up on the beach, I noticed, with this wind, which is a strong, strong northwesterly. The reason I got my rods down there, well, the tide's going to push up to here. You can see the tide line there, guys. See the tide line? That's a previous high water mark. So I know the tide's coming up to here with this wind. But if I have my rods up here, the tripod, there's a lot of weed going along on the edge of the wave line. I'm going to pick it up. So I've got my rods down there to keep them up and over the weed. A massive amount of weed there. It's a real no-go zone. I've got a little spinning rod here, which I had hoped, no, just a little put together made up spinning rod, I had hoped to actually throw that out with a single sand needle and get lucky. But I, I see no reason to put it out there because it's going to get snagged. Weed and light rods do not go together. Anyway, wait for Craig to turn up and then do you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to see if my phone signal works and I'm going to order in a pizza and see if I can get a pizza down these cliffs. I've got to eat something tonight. Might not be fish, it's going to be something, a pizza. I'm going to get number one daughter to tramp 200 feet down the cliff and give her poor old dad a pizza. Listen, they want to go shopping, what do they expect? There's a price to pay for stopping me fishing. I'm cheap, it's a pizza. It was then the crate turned up on the beach and yes, he is a masterclass fisherman and has, well he's my new best friend because he has very good bait. And a lot of this fishing down here in that coloured water is you need good bait presentation but you need to pick the right scent, the right juice coming out of your bait because I feel that's what the fish home in on. I'm going to use a baiting tool, a uh, double baiting tool to make a squid and mackerel cocktail. Uh, first of all I'm going to kebab the squid onto one of the prongs and then slide a piece of slither of mackerel, carefully not to pierce in the skin, onto the other kebab on the other prong. 
pull them together so they sit nice and straight. So just pull them together gently and with a bit of elastic. You put the skin side in there, Craig, yeah, and I let put the, the meat skin, out. Yeah, I put the skin side out, the skin side in, because obviously the oil is in the flesh, um, and obviously the blood's in the flesh as well. And it just, if you if you put the flesh against the squid, it would just protect it, and it wouldn't, you know, wouldn't it, get the, it, wouldn't it, get the smell it would leak out. out for longer, but it wouldn't, you wouldn't have the initial initial scent coming out. So I've got a bit of elastic on there just to, to keep it in place. Uh, and I'm going to use a, a panel hook. Because uh, it's a not, it's not too small a bait, but it's big enough to warrant a panel hook. Um, I've got a pair of 3.0 Cox and Rule specimen extra hooks, super strong, super sharp. Um, just two o three o. Two o three. These are both 3.0s, A pair of 3.0s on there. Um, you know, there's not many fish that's going to snap. You know, real good, strong, sharp hook. Then what we want to do is just nick into the bait slightly, and then turn it round. Leave and then put, pr apply a little bit of pressure on the eye of the hook, just keep it straight. And then pick up the elastic, just elasticate the shank of the hook to the bait. So you can see I've got my thumb on the eye and just several turns of that, you know, don't have to be too shy, maybe 20, 30 turns, but just enough to keep it on there. And you can see the juice start to drip out here then, yeah, like you said. Yeah, it's seriously juicy, like, yeah. it's nice. Uh, and then, obviously, we can just take that off the baiting tool. And obviously, the, the benefit of a baiting tool, you can see that's quite a nice straight bait. Most of the time, if you were to do that by hand, you'd end up, it'd be like banana, bent, yeah. and all wobbly, and when it casts, it goes wobbly. Um, but that just keeps it nice and just a nice sort of presentation. But with the top hook, we've got a bit of neoprene keeping it in, in line. It's quite, quite firm in there. What I'm going to do is just get the point of the hook, point it in the top, turn it round like so, and then just pull that little loop of line up in there. And there you go. This is why this is why Craig is a guide and I'm not. Already he's got a conger eel. Well done, Craig. So what was that on, Craig? A uh, squid and mackerel combination. A combo? Yeah. Good show. And these are going to grow to what uh, on this beach, Craig? Um, like you get five you, or ten pounders? Yeah, you get them up to twenty pounds uh, in the autumn on here. Come in to feed on the whiting, uh, but you know this time we get lots of straps between sort of this size and uh, and ten pound at the moment. Hey, turned round and gone. Okay, okay, you're on your way then. Brilliant, brilliant. This is a way to do it, boys. Watch this. Watch this. A pizza delivery on the beach. This is how you've got to get your fishing organised. Now, listen. Craig's had that small conger. This is what you call service with a smile. It's windy. You might not get it. Can you train? Hi, pizza, honey. Here we go. Uh, this is pizza. pizza. Oh my On god. Pizza here. Beer in the pocket. Oh my god. This is what you call guys. Look. This is delivery. I feel bad fishing next to Craig now. He's had the conga. There's coleslaw and potato salad. Yeah. And a little spoon in case Craig wants a little bit of salad or something. Mum, oh, spare next. spoon as a well. A little spoon to like put on the plate. If it, what, all the Brilliant. It's all hot. So there's pizza in that, but you could spoon a little bit onto that if he wants a bit of potato salad or something. Thank yeah, you very much. Like, you can go to bed now, though. Yeah, She's in her pajamas. Get, get your daughter down here in pajamas, walking down 200 foot cliff. <laughs> Thank you very much. Oh, she's off to watch Blind Date. I'm off to neck this pizza. Still got a chance of a fish. Craig lost a really, we think, a really good bass. I wonder if he wants a piece of pizza. He doesn't want a beer. I've offered him a beer. That is a way to just phone up the top of the caravan at St Audrey's, get hold of your family. Obviously, I've had theirs. Bingo. Pizza. Coleslaw. Oh, man, I'm having a good time already. Hot pizza, this is too, guys, look. <laughs> no opener. Oh, my God. I've even got, I've even got a little table prepared for it, look. 
Oh my god, potato salad and uh, coleslaw, closely followed by, oh look man, meat feast pizza, does life get any better than that? All I need is about a four or five pound bass and I've died and gone to heaven. Oh yeah, and a bottle opener. And then the fish catching machine called Craig comes up the beach and this time he's got a small tope. How does he do it? Are you getting many of those this year, Craig? Seems to be a well, few around. unusual? Is no, it's the, every summer we get these little tiny tope in. So. Like perfect miniature, aren't they? Oh no, just look at the sort of colour along the flank there. Still yeah. a miniature predator, aren't they? Yeah. How long do they last here for, you know? They just seem to be around for sort of like the summer and autumn and then they just disappear. Well guys, the wind's gone down. Ashley caught a tiny baby congrue, but it saved the blank. But something interesting, we've had a few traces twisted up and Craig's gonna tell you about the uh, different types of eels, which you can get another eel down here, which I think is a freshwater one, but we'll show you this one anyway. Graham's just reeled in this little baby strap eel, um, cast previous. Um, reeled in a real twisted up rig, uh, which probably down to the green eel, uh, which would obviously spun on the bait. And then literally next cast, um, Graham's had this, so the green eel might have been the small strap eel doing it. That's a freshwater eel, is it? Yeah, the green eel is a freshwater, comes into the channel and obviously goes up the tributaries to, to, um, to sort of grow on. It comes in as elvers. Uh, yeah, they come in as elvers, live up in the freshwater for a while. And then when they go back to sea and move out to the Sargasso SOC, they sort of like run down the shoreline. And unusual for me, it's hooked perfectly. <laughs> Guys, what they say with the uh, freshwater reel is that they actually go across the grass in, on wet nights to go from lake to lake as well. So if we put this one near the water, I'm wondering if he'll find his way back in. Lucky. I lost another fish out there as well, didn't I, Craig? Had a bite. Yeah, it was a good bite. I might have been a bit too keen on it, but that's that one there. Look, they're not huge eels, but it's a bit of sport to catch. I don't go, forget, I'm just in the caravan side at the top of the hill. It's got to be pizza delivery, conga delivery. It won't get any better than that. Got the hook out there, guys. Gonna get him straight back in. That's a bit more like it. And I feel, do you know what? Might be coming back here tomorrow night as well. We're always quite obliging the conger eels here. <laughs> Thank goodness, they need, they <laughs> Thank need God. to be for me, Craig. <laughs> Oh, another one, boys. <laughs> hey. This is a place for the eels. <laughs> what base that one, Craig? Uh, again, it's a squid. Uh, just a yes, a whole squid. This one. Just a whole squid on there. Squid on its own. Yeah. Yeah. I nearly didn't bring the floodlight, you know, I thought, I'm only going to get two hours up, two hours down, I won't need a floodlight, you know, but I think a good job I did. Yeah. Lovely blue tinge along that back they have there. Yeah, it's lovely. And we're nearly out of water, aren't we, Craig? I reckon, yeah, it's probably on the last cast now. 
but there again, last cast, there's plenty of eels hanging around, isn't there? Well, you were saying that about uh, so many waters down this way, tune that light down. Uh, you were saying that, you know, the sort of, not the dying air because it's going to ebb for another four hours, but yeah. the bottom end of it is yeah, all, always that, that, pretty that good. Sort of, after 90 minutes, after 90 minutes, you get a good flush of fish off the beach. And weed's gone, I noticed. Yeah, the weed's moved off. But now, even now, it's time you get, you could get a half decent bass on the sort of pushing into the third hour of the flood. But, uh, but yeah, when the, when the water sort of hits the level le level of the beach, it just goes out and it's just... It's gone then, it's, it's gone, gone, yeah. yeah. All right, should we get this? Yeah, get him package? back, yeah. I tell you what, people are just grateful for tonight. In fact, I made myself with that bad weather coming in. So pleased I made myself come out. And Craig was good enough to come out and help us as well. Just a few hours fishing, just a few hours, six till nine, three hours, boom, boom, boom. Got some great action. And don't worry, my rods are still out there. We're on the last five minute warning. But if I can get those women sorted with some shopping tomorrow and the rain goes through, I'm gonna try and hit this place tomorrow night because Craig's pretty sure he lost a really big bass. Yeah, great session, great pizza, <laughs> great beer. What a night, I love it. Good session for a little short, two and a half hours that was really good so here I am in my caravan do you call it it can't be a caravan it's a mobile home look at it I mean it's got all you could want isn't it we're not selling them no but nice little area especially as the weather is a horror story out there it's absolutely windy it's tipping down they give the whole day of this it might clear it might clear by four o'clock tonight the sort of benefit is the ladies want to go to one of the local churches down the road, little pretty church, they want to go down there, fine. I thought, hmm, bit of space here. I'll drop them off, come in a nice dry caravan, as you can see, like this. And I'll show you guys the pulley rig, because I'm going to be using that, I hope tonight, to induce them in. Now listen, is this bad? I don't know, you guys tell me, is this bad? I told them, it's very, very busy over here, and you've got to book early for a meal. Six o'clock. Now, ladies like dressing up and they like eating at eight o'clock, but I've told them we'll never eat, we'll never eat in time unless we get booked early. It's a sort, it's a sort of a white lie. It's a white lie, it's not a bad one, is it really? I think it's a sort of a white lie because obviously I want to get down there because the tide's about 40 minutes later. So a little bit naughty, but less than it's the way it is. I'm going to put the camera here and then I'm going to show you um, the rigs. I've got a couple of jobs to do, which is ideal in here, it gives me the space to do it and I'm bone dry. Okay, the sort of best I can do, I don't know if you can get the sound, I've clicked the, uh, the mic, put the microphone over there and I've got that lead. I'm guessing you're going to see me there. I've, I've, got, the, I've got the pole balance in the gas fire. <laughs> got to laugh, haven't you? Give myself a bit of space here. Put the other camera's here. That's the other thing that's been an absolute boon to me. The little cheap, really cheap mic got this. It's got a Fresnel screen at the front, so I can put uh, a tester on the back and different filters if I want them. And of course, put it on low or wallop high. Absolutely a saviour. And it fits on top of the small camera because the big camera I lumber around weighs pounds and I just cannot face, you know, using it. Plus, what we have found is the microphone sensitivity is so good on that big camera, it picks up everything. Now then, just for you camera buffs out there, if you've got wind noise in the background when you're talking, it can be really annoying. Well, you can reduce that wind noise, obviously with the software edit suite you have, but you're also reducing the audio, audible, you know, regular, so it's going really, really quiet, so you can't hear. Equally, if the talking is, let's say, a little bit quiet and you want to raise that. If you raise it up, you raise up all the extraneous sounds of the world out there. A guy with a chainsaw down the road, somebody riding a motorbike, an aeroplane flying over. So it's a problem. But what I did find this little hot chute attachment on here. So I forgot to bring my headlamp for, you know, fishing in the dark. So last night we got away with putting, just mounting this on there and locking it down. So handy. I have no tripod. Again, I left the tripod get one of those little folding tripods rather than a big heavy thing I have to carry. So here we go guys. I got snagged once out there. I'm going to go down later on and see if I can find that rig. Wait for the tide to go out. I don't know what time I've got to pick the girls up. There's nothing we can do today. It's a horror story. 
So it was on braid. Now here's something. I'm on here. Let me bring you a bit close and you can see the gear. I'm going to get it out and I'm going to sort through and I've got to make up another uh, pulley rig or two. Okay, let's do it this way. I've got the head cam on so hopefully I can I can show you everything. So, listen, normally you get your reel and you have the shock leader on top. In my case, this would be, I think it's 18, uh, 20, 18 or 20 pound, that black line underneath, and the yellow stuff on the top will be my shock leader to stop you breaking off. More for beginners to shop you stop you breaking the lead off, okay? No problem, that one's okay. The other one, when I got in the snag, I had to pull for a break. So consequently, as you can see, the shock leader's gone because it invariably will break at the knot where the, where the weak spot will be just there where the line joins the uh, main line joins the shock leader that's indeed what happened I've also got a little bit less line on here because I've noticed if you fill these braid ones up they tend to explode and fluff out fly out and you can get a tangle and get a crack off they seem to cast better with a little bit of uh, reduction line reduction from the spool there hey ho that's the way it is but this is braid, now what make is this? Braid, sidewinder braid, sidewinder silk, that's what it is. I think this is 40 pounds, so I had a hell of a job breaking it. And I thought, well, I've only got a two and a half hour session. How am I gonna, you know, get tie up a, a shock leader, get it out quick? So I just tied the rig straight on the end here. I had no problem at all casting. The only problem I had was with my finger, because a braid, if I really whacked it, would you know, what I'm saying, it'll cut your finger, maybe it would do. So you could use a finger stall for casting, but I'm going to put another shock leader on that anyway, but I wonder if you have, say, 50 pound braid, which is very fine diameter, just go straight through. Do you need a shock leader? Effectively, this is a shock leader. Maybe somebody could tell me, you know, should I be using braid as a shock leader or should I be using a standard 50-60? I'm not, not pendulum casting. So don't worry, guys, all you pendulum guys out there. I'm not pendulum casting. I'm just chucking it out and catching fish like the rest of the average, you know, people do fishing. Right, the pulley rig. It's pulley rig. Do you know what? If anybody deserves a medal, it's the guy who invented the pulley rig. My goodness me, what a rig it is. But I've got to upgrade the hooks. So... I always forget how to make these. I've got these little jam jars and that just keeps everything bone dry. Now you can get these little coils, you can make them up yourself. Um, I think what the best thing is to do is, is to get my rigs out and just make a pulley rig up. Now I'm not, uh, I'm not saying which hooks to use, which makes, which, ma which, which brands, but I want a fairly strong hook and I want pulley beads. So we turn them all over. This one, actually, here, these are old ones. Oh, God knows, I've had these 30 years. These are an old Cox and Wall up tide. Uh, it says chemically sharpened, and they are. Can't even read that. High tensile, so strong, strong in the wire. I've got a 2 0 or a, I think that says 3 0. So, being as those small conger eels out there, I think I'm going to go for a 3 0 there. These are the pulley beads. Let me show you one of those. These are, you can make them with a swivel. You can just use a swivel there. But the pulley bead seems to work quite well. And then I can basically get one set up. I'm gonna put mine on, uh, I think it's about 55 pound mono. Right, people, bit of a mess of a tackle box. Take this camera bag off that, give us a bit more space. Oh, well, let's replace it with something that could be lucky. Yes, they're totally awesome hat's gotta get in there. So I got me some, I think it's 55 pound tournament. I took a, it's left over from my marlin fishing reel and my shark fishing. So I'm going to take about, if I can get that knot undone. You can put a rubber band around these spools, guys. You know, it helps, you know, stops all this hassle of trying to find the end of the knot. So I'm going to pull off about, I'm going to say, let's say three feet or so of this sort of 55 pound, just to give me something to work with. Your main thing is, I'm going to call it your actual hook length needs to be shorter than your main rig body. Onto that, I'm going to tie my lead link clip, which could be that one, or it could be that one. Now, if you look carefully, I don't know if you're going to see it with this camera, that's got a little notch bent back there. That's to take to support the hook bend when you cast. This one hasn't, so it'll be swinging loose, but you can get around that if you wanted to use. Let's say, let's find one here for you. 
one of these links, which again, as you can see, it's got that little notch in it you can rest the hook into, and a sort of a paddle tail at the end there. So when the water impacts and lead's coming down here, it knocks that paddle tail back, pushes and releases the hook from there, and the whole rig on your tray swings free. You could use that. But so you've got, let's basically say you've got two on this side with with the uh, bait retaining clips. You might not have a particular one like this, but you can get around that by using these things, which is this slides up the line and this peg goes in there. And that also will go above, it. if I light like that, it will go above, let's move these two out of the way, that would be a, your hook bend, your bait holder goes in there as well. So let's tie these up. So the first thing I'm going to tie on, in this case, is my lead link clip. Don't forget with pliers, you've got different grips here, look, a thick coarse grip, a smooth area, and a, just a finer rough edge to it there, which gives me the a uh, bit of grip to pull this knot down. I've already put some saliva on there, or in common language, spit on there to moisten it and pull that knot down. You can see this, I might try and do it once, it's always difficult. There we go, it goes down nice and snug like that. Now you can snip it off really flush. Some people like to be neat and tidy, but occasionally there might be some freak of nature whereby that slips. So I don't cut it too close. I try and cut it just leaving a little tag of a few millimetres to allow it if something does go wrong. Right, that's my, going to take my lead, okay? Now I'm going to put on here my pulley bead. Here you can see it's basically a swivel with a moulded plastic bead. You go through the eye there and that, that's just hanging loose. This end ties to your main line. Now on the other end of this I'm going to tie a standard swivel. A little bit of spit on it. If I can pull that down, I've no idea whether you're getting this. I've got no monitor on this camera. Hey, down we go. That pulls down. Snip off, leaving just a few millimeters. I'll try and put the bits left over in my bag, okay? So you've got swivel, length of main body rig, pulley bead, grip. Now, on the end of this, I've now got to put to the under end of this is my hook link or trace or snood, call it what you want. It's really sort of trace. I think Americans call it trace and we call it, you know, hook links and stuff like that. That needs to be shorter than the whole length of this. That's very important. Make sure you pull, peel off enough line. Always a little bit too much is better than not enough. Now I tie my hook on first. Now, because we, had those congas last night, I'm thinking some of my pulley rigs don't have quite strong enough wire on them. Just so people ask, these are like, I don't even know they make them anymore. These are a Cox and Rule Uptide chemically sharpened high tensile hook. Oh my God, that sounds cool. This is a G4803. It is a 3.0, which I feel for the chance of a bass or conga would be about right here. Well, what you want is a good, strong wire and these ones I find I've got many of them left actually is quite a good strong wire hook as opposed to let's say an Aberdeen in here which is very bendy is more of a worm hook so same principle tie my blood knot on there this one I put the pliers right up in the bend of the hook here take a good couple of wraps and just pull apart to pull that knot like that pinch straight down there if you can see that hopefully you can now, definitely, definitely you want to leave a tag in there because if you do want to use worm baits or indeed anything, it does help to hold, you know, a bait on that little tag. That's quite rigid. You know, it's like 55 pound, I think this is, so it's quite, quite rigid. And that's a brand new hook with a fairly small bar, but it's sharp. Now, there's my trace. I'm going to alter this camera angle to show you what I mean about tying the hook link on, which is most important with a pulley rig. Okay, what I do first is because that line is used anyway, it's off one of my marlin reels, is it's got line memory retention in it from the spool. So when you use it, and there's nothing wrong with it for traces, you've got coils, I just hold the bend of the hook, don't pull the hook in your fingers, and I just heat it like this under pressure. Don't burn your fingers, which you can do. Warm it two or three times like this. 
and you can do it on the shock, the main, what they call the rig body. Hold it in a loop, just give it 10 seconds. And if you watch all those, all those coils, nice and limp and straight. So here we go. If you saw my tripod, you'd laugh. It's a heap of cushions. I'm going to knock it off. So there's my, 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 my clip there. I clip my lead on there. All right, you can see this now. You can see that hanging there. Now my main line is going onto the bead. Watch the lead go down. It's like a pulley. See the pulley system? Look, hopefully you guys can see this. Pulley is a brilliant rig. Whoever invented it, it's brilliant. It comes up against a the swivel there. So that will be, I'll tell you what it's close to. That is three feet. What a measurement. But what you've got to make sure is when you tie up here your trace or your hook or your hook length, whatever you want to call it, this hook with a bait on can't be longer than the lead because it's not going to hook onto that clip. So it needs to hook onto that clip like that. So what I do is put the bend in the hook into the clip, keep it tight in there, a bit fiddly, and then I make sure, I'll come back here, as I pull it, this side comes tight, watch, and then goes a little bit slack. See this side go slack, watch, I'll show you again. It's all for beginners, experts, move along, there's nothing we can teach you. Tight like that, pull up the hook length, just to give you a tiny bit of slack like that on this rig body, and then tie your blood loop in there. That way your hook length is going to be at the right length to keep it tight when you cast. Because basically if you can clip down, God gave us teeth for eating and tying fishing knots. On here, bit of spit, pull down tight. I'll show you this closer. Snip off if I can find my snippers. What a day to do a tackle tool. Ideal. No wind and it's rocking outside. Rain could ease off later on tonight. I hope so. The girls have got to have their early evening meal. <laughs> so there we go. I'm going to tie on here. It's ideal to tell somebody to begin this rig. Right. Now you can see that's pulled tight. The hook doesn't quite reach the clip. But if it does reach a clip, I have to pull a bit of slack up, put the bend in, and then look, the whole rig, see, lead, hook, clip, trace. This bit's tied by the bead, is tied to my fishing shock leader or line. You cast out, whiz, 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 with the bait on there. The lead hits first, it goes bonk. Oh gosh, it's all fall three, fall three, fall three. That T was strong, fallen three. But better, when you pull in, okay, here comes Mr. Fish, he grabs the hook, he pulls, he gives you the bite, you wind to pull in, and generally if you're over rough ground, as you pull in, watch this lead. I'll have to do this shorter. You wind to pull in, the lead comes up off the deck, look, look, it's pulling, it's pulling, it's raising it off the deck. So instead of being dragged along the ground when you're fighting the fish, snagging up and you lose the lot, this pulley rig pulls right up like this tight, and then you pull the fish up and the lead is slightly up in the water, hopefully away from the snags. And finally, I'll show you that other little clip. This one's going straight out tonight, I assure you. Well, right, I've tied my little clip on the end there, but just to illustrate to you, I'm hoping you can see this. Look at this going up and down like a clock spring, isn't it? See it? Absolutely coil beyond belief. Pull it, don't burn your fingers. You can also do it across the knee like this. You can go backwards and forward, Rub it backwards and forwards across your knee, across your trousers. I've done it very hard, and yes, I have cut through my jeans. I've obviously burnt my fingers as well. That's why I know it gets hot. But you're basically imparting heat into that monofilament leader. Three, four times like this. And then just take a wrap, just hold it. Ten seconds. That's all it takes. Ten seconds. Look. Look how limp that's gone. Okay. I'll show you how this one works. So this is the other plastic clip. So your hook here, I'm hoping you can see, let's just get this camera right. Hopefully you can see the clip here and the hook. So that is the way the plastic clip goes. You place your hook into the bend there with your, obviously with your bait on, you don't catch too much if you don't have any bait on. Then when this hits the water, the impact pushes on that paddle just there. Can you see it's like a, a flat piece there? Hopefully you can see that. It pushes on that and bingo, releases the hook. 
So I find these a bit fiddly to use, but they are very efficient. Watch again. Put it over the carpet. You might be able to see it there. It impacts. Vroom. The lead hits the water. The water hits that little face there, and it just goes ping, and the hook falls free. Now, I'll show you the other one, which if you have run out of... I'll put that there so the wife can sit on that. She'll love that when she comes in. I'm sure I need the hook off of that one, tell a lie. If you've run out of those clips that do, you know, bait holding clips, when you've just got the plain one like that, don't worry because you can get some of these sliding and adjustable. I assume they still make them. It's a, it's a sleeve into which you put a peg and you can push that down really tight and slide it where you want it. Let's I say obviously there. Again, the hook goes into it, okay, like that. Just rest in the bend, rest in there. But you're relying solely on the impact of the lead to release that. So occasionally you might not get a release, but what I'm saying is it's still a bait holding clip. It's still an attachment that works. Then all you do if you made these pulley rigs up is get a hold of one of these spools, start with the bait clip, you know, your lead clip first, and you wind it around and around. You might want to overlap it a couple of times. On goes the pulley bead, wind it round and round. And if you make half a dozen of these up, especially if you're fishing over snaggy rough ground, I don't put the hook in there. Most people do. I put it into the side under tension because that way it fits into my jar, goes flat, and I can keep at least six in there. That could be bad luck falling off that. It's a lucky hat. It's got to stay there. And then I can, I've just got this screw lid, as you can see, keeps everything dry and they're all flat. I get about one, two, three, I can get five or six. So there you go. We've done the rig making. I've made a few more rigs for tonight. Fingers crossed, fingers crossed this shocking. I mean, weather out there, you don't even want to look out there, people. It's horrible. I'm in the best place. <laughs> I've done loads of camping, I've done loads of sleeping in cars, but gas central heating, full kitchen, television, man, this has got to be the way to come. And listen, the, the beach, the fishing spot's just down there. Right, let's get this cleared up before the wife comes in, pick them up, and fingers crossed, the rain stops for tonight. Right, people, it's just easing a tad. I'm going to come down. Now, look at the difference. Can you people see this out there? Look at the difference in all that sort of reefy area. And we think when we're casting here, you see it better from up here. There's a line, all you fishermen will see, it's broken down a delineating line just there with a ridge. So at high water, you barely need to cast out. Got sand there, so maybe the fish running up and down this channel. But more important, Craig reckons that rough ground over the back there, as we get pushed down, we can cast further. The conger eels we were getting picked up are in those gullies over there. So there's a tiny seagull there. So I'm going to have a look to see what the ground looks like and it'll give me an idea for tonight. He also said down there on the right is a gully that fills up easier. You know, a bit easier, just quicker. So I'm going down the steps. What a pleasure to come down here without 50 pounds of camera equipment and tackle. Just hope we don't get water on the lens. There, guys. Now, look, you have to look at places at low tide. Look at the difference. Shingle, sand, reefy area. Mud, reef, weed, kelp. Here's where we were fishing. See, there's a tiny little waterfall coming up there. So that's where we were fishing. going to pan down. Straight away, it breaks here over to shingle. I was casting out that way. I've got to be close to getting snagged up out there somewhere. That's where it was. I mean, not a huge amount of people fish here. It's popular, but... Not enough to leave a load of sla snag line. See, I'm looking how far we're casting. I'm probably only making that sand. Wow, that wind's still there. Unfortunately, Craig said it's going to go back northwesterly, so it's going to be a tough one. Switch this off for a second. I was, I was, I'm casting. It's beside of that. Now, did my line, my leader, go round here? Because this is rare to get snagged around here. I don't think I went that far. Say high water. It's got a yellow cap to it anyway, the uh, lead. See if I got, oh, here you go. What's this? What is this lot? Now my line's not red, but just as a guide, I'm gonna take this up because somebody has lost some red line here. Now this could have been washed in from the tide somewhere else. It remind me to uh, go through that so nothing gets tangled in it. 
And look how the, it breaks here. There's the break onto clean sand. So quite steep, then plateaus off. So once that tide starts to go, it goes really quickly. Oh, <laughs> here we go. Ah, interesting people, very interesting. A rig, now was that lost this morning? It's the same lead as mine. So, somebody else has been fishing, I lost a load of lead. Well, that's, no, that's the distance off the beach, okay? That's the distance off the beach. Somebody else has been fishing there. Why have they lost that? You know, why have you, have, you, have they sort of lost, get, oh, oh, hang on, hang on, hang on. What's this one? Well, that's bizarre. Ah, this is not my rig, I don't think. Yes, this is my rig. This is my rig, this one is not. But look at this guy, look what I hooked into. No wonder I broke off, look. It's caught into an old sleeper that was there. Absolutely jammed in, just running in. The chance of getting that is like zero, and, and the hook didn't quite open up. Now, I think Craig said he uses a springy one, so that if you do get in a snake, it comes out. This would never come out, actually buried in the wood. I'm so pleased. I found my rig. There's my leader. I knew, and I think the knot, I think I told you, I bet it broke on the, on the bridge just there, so I haven't lost much line. Brilliant, absolutely brilliant. I'm actually a lead up. I'm a lead up. <laughs> oh, I'm so pleased to get this. Oh my God. A lead up, nobody gets tangled in it. And I just got, well, I think I'd never cast and reach out again. Brilliant. Let's put it there and I'll sort it out in a minute. Okay, now here is the edge. edge. Look, there's the smooth stuff. The rain's coming in again. What a good job I bought the umbrella. And you can see here, this is a sort of hard, hard rock bits, but they're not sort of altogether snaggy, but you've got a whole bed of, uh, what are we calling this, blad rack. Now you're gonna lose your rig in there for sure. And obviously from up there, I cannot possibly reach this, even if the tide comes down, because what happens is, the tide's going lower and lower and lower on here, but it runs around the edge, outside and through, and this is higher. So this will become dry while there's still some water in here, if that makes sense. It's going to be so shallow, the fish will know they're going to get trapped, know they're going to get caught, and they'll have left. They will have left. So you're literally about two and a half hours down, and I think from there, that's, I wouldn't reach as 150 yards, I should think. So I think I'm pretty safe all the way along here. But you can see, I'm squishing in it already. These banks have come up here. Well, they've come up, they've been there for years, but they, you know, they're raised is what I'm trying to say. And I believe Congress, Craig's right there, hunting in amongst all of this. Get back in case this is quicksand. Well, I'll just have a look, see if there's any other rigs along here. Now, I suppose you could actually follow the water down a bit. If you did want to fish out there, you want to fish a plain grip lead over that snaggy stuff, but you want to be reaching the edge of these, these gullies. Now, if I, if I put this camera like this and I, and, I, and I crouch down, in fact, let me take it off a second. Take it. Now, if you look here, that's nearly on the sand. If you look over the back there, that comes up about over two feet, two feet or so. That bank here, I don't want to get completely soaking booties, but I just thought it was of interest to you. <gasps> Backtrack slowly. Don't show the people, Graham. You won't live to tell the tale. If you just look there, and I go down low like this, you can see there's at least a two foot bank of rock, I guess, there. And then it comes up and over the top there. Am I gonna reach out from there? No, I'm not. So I think I'm pretty safe to come down here and even about an hour or so down, I can really pump that lead out and hopefully I feel the good spot, the sweet spot would be along this edge here. On the sand, because that's falling quite a bit here, there'd be current flow, food particles get swept along here. And I'm saying that because look at this, you can see or should be able to see how this is draining all those tiny pieces going past there, all back in, yes, towards that sort of little mild reefy area. And that is where conga, bass and rays are going to work. If I was a fish, I'd be working along this edge. Rain's barreling in now. I'm just trying to see if there's any depressions. If you can see, I hold the camera very still over there. 
it's drier, this is more wet. I know it sounds stupid because it's raining, but I think that's raised there. The ground's slightly raised, so that might be a little bit milder there. Most people, if you're looking for bits of gear lost by people, they're not going to walk miles. Look, the camp's up there, but most people, only the serious angler's going to walk a long way to Marks. Joe Average is just walking as close to those stairs as he can. It's the way it is. So I'm figuring if there's any lost tackle, it's got to be along this area. Wow, I'm nearly losing the umbrella. Well, I think, uh, whoa, oh my God. Another rig. Now all these leads have different cap weights. Or cap weights, you know, they, they mean something. Uh, this was from this morning. This is definitely, we did not fish this morning, but somebody's been down here, I feel, this morning. That squid on there, I've got to watch my hook, is still fresh. It's been baited up properly, elasticated thread, and it's a fixed. Now, Craig was on a pulley rig, guys. That's fixed. Look, it's fixed two hook snood. That's going in the pocket. That's very interesting. That's two leads I found that weren't housed here last night. So they're casting, oh look, oh here we go, oh my god, he must have lost a conga. I guess it's a dead one. Oh my god, it's live, oh my god, it's still live. The guy's lost it, let's see if it, he's lost it as the tide goes out this morning. And the poor old conga, just what I said, couldn't get back. He was, he was trapped by the water running off quickly here. So there you go, let's see if we can, whoa, hang on boys, I'm trying to save your life here, pal. Give me a break, don't turn around and bite me. That's a nice conga. That is bizarre. See, nobody else has been down here this morning because of the, the weather, I'm the only idiot. And there's a fish inside him, I can feel it. There's actually a fish inside there. I'm gonna try and walk all the way around, see if we can't get this conga back in the water. Look at that, guys. I've never done that, ever seen that. A live fish cut off by the tide. Oh, I've only got to walk four miles. Well, the tide's going to be coming in. I could, I suppose, I could maybe leave him in a rock pool. Is that safer? Oh, I don't want it. Oh, I'm going down. What do you think? That's miles out. I think he's better off in a rock pool. Painfully obvious he's alive. Just watch him. Oh, Christ. He's got a chance. Look, 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 look. He's way alive. There he'll lay in. Oh God, I'm in the rock pool as well. I've done my bit for the day. I've saved somebody else's conga. That was, I've never seen that ever. Ever, ever, ever. So the guy's lost the conga, okay. Get this mud off. What a state I'm getting in. Gonna get soaked as well. The guy's lost the conga right on the bottom of low tide this morning. The conga has then been unable to follow back the falling tide. He can't get over there and he's got trapped down there. He's cut off, there's nowhere to go. He would probably, in fairness, have stayed alive. But wow, that was, that was cool, I'd never seen that before. Interesting. Now, I'm gonna get back before I get trapped in the mud. Now, the same stake that I lost my rig on I've noticed here, there's another two. Now these are huge railway sleepers. So what was down here? Is there an entire village down here? Does anybody know? Is there a St Audrey's Bay village down here? I mean, goodness, it's 100 yards off the, off the shoreline. What would have been built there? And where I lost up there somewhere was on the same line. There's a lot of archeological history in the sea law of this area. Yes, you people know I am scanning for three leads. Well, strange guys, because I found another three of these massive sleepers that have been uncovered in the storms here. All facing that way, so I guess be, the storm's driven them this way. But if you look, one, two, three, one over there, and the one I say is a big semicircle. Was this an old fashioned harbour there at some stage, it looks like three more up here. I just find all this intriguing, we need to be an archaeology expert. There's definitely something, well, there's something's been built here, these just haven't got washed up vertically, they've been driven in with a huge pile drive, I must ask Craig about that, look. 
Look, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That is strange. Now I've got to look here and think, right where we were fishing, no wonder I had a chance of snagging. I think I'll come down tonight. I might even go to the left. I think I might go to the left that way. Hmm, interesting. First, we need the wind to dry down and the rain to stop. I better shoot back, and this girl's going to be champing at the bit to go shopping or something. Let's make sure I take my, uh, my stash with me, or somebody else's stash. Sort it out here. Oh, don't say there's a weight on there as well. There's sure to be some free hooks and free beads. Oh, hey, there's more lying up here. Wait, 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 wait. That's some angler has lost red line, which I don't have. I'm following it down. Hopefully this is shock leader coming. Oh my God. At the end of the shock leader is, is, please let it be there. Nothing. More line. Man, that's a shock leader of 100 feet. At the end of it is, 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 oh yes! Oh, what? Get in! Another lead, different shape, same standoff rig. Man alive, I'm running in profit. That's rare for me. Huge amount of line. Now listen, the problem being people, when you lose fishing line, it just creates another snag for other people to get their hooks in and they lose more tackle and more tackle and more tackle. So why not take the trouble that I'm doing to pick it all up Either burn it. God, this guy's using a like hundred pound line. Look, three different people have lost gear here. Definitely, look. Yellow, green, orange. No, 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 Graham, Graham, where's the lead, mate? We'll get the lead first. That's the most expensive bit. Well, people, I needn't have worried about the, well, the slightly little white lie that, uh, they're so busy. Oops, I've got an umbrella here because the wind's howling. That they're so busy at the restaurant that we needed to book early because the wife could sense that I was suddenly getting very agitated half an hour before going for our booking, our book table, and she knows I would have shoveled the food down and wanted to pressure them to leave. And they said, why aren't you eating here at St Aldry's? How good is that? I forgot they actually have a restaurant here. Pint of beer. Scambia chips, job done. Craig's already down here, over here. Craig's already because he is after that big bass. I mean, we could catch anything, but he adamantly lost a big bass last night. Another gentleman, I'm gonna peep over the umbrella because there's rain coming in over there big time for my head. Another gentleman fishing right down there. So fingers crossed, we've got baits out, I've got mackerel out. I've got a thing of squid wrap that Craig's already made up with an up and over rig. And I've got my pulley rig out that I showed you before. Got a new battery in the camera. The tide is up, it's half an hour or so, 40 minutes later. So we're gonna fish into the dark. My God, I hope it doesn't rain anymore. We've had enough rain today to, to float Noah's Ark away. So fingers crossed we get to show you yet another fish. Another one or two of those congas will be nice. A bass or a ray be even better. But you know what? We've got two and a half hours. We're out here anyway, that's all that matters.
there we go, a little, a little small thorn back ray. Uh, saw a bite about five minutes ago, the tip pulled down and just sort of hung there for a, a few seconds and then just did nothing. So I left it for a few minutes and thought I'd better reel in, change the bait. And uh, this little chap was just asleep chewing away on the bait. So on a half a crab and a 3-0 ocox and roll specimen hook. So good fish, good yeah, fish, right. isn't it? Yeah. Rough night and a good fish. Personal smallest, small thorn back this, I think. A, a PB. PB smallest. <laughs> <laughs> uh, greedy little thing. And we're right at the top of the tide now, Craig. Pretty think? much, yeah, pretty much. Just about 15 minutes into the ebb, so, you know, hopefully, might get a couple more of these. And a bass. And a bass, yeah, <laughs> the one which we, we didn't catch yesterday, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, it was on a smallish bait, sort of small, smaller hole on my squid, and a bit of mackerel and a single 3 0 Cox and Rule specimen hook. So, one of the great things about night fishing is you never really know what's going to come along. It, you know, really is the time to fish. For me, nothing comes along. Well, not too often. So I figure the next day I'm going down the coast into Devon and see what I can catch on LRF rods. Guys, a little wrasse there, just on a piece of crab. I if you can see that. Made up for last night. Just a small one. And back he goes. Different species this time, people. 
just a small one, just a small pollock. But you can see very small hooks there. Just a bit of fun on it. Look. And you can see the tiny amount of it's holding like that. Good conga bait, but he's going to go back. And all I've got just here, so I'll show you the rig. Just got a little egg sinker there, an American egg sinker. Straight off, two hook pattern oster, should be able to see it there against the skyline. Just lose a tiny, tiny, I don't know, so it'd be about size 10, those two hooks there. About size 10. Just dropping it down, you can just feel them tap on there. Generally get the fish, I would suggest closer to the pilings, but not knowing this place and never having fished before, you'll be better off um, casting a little way out and then working your way in. Although I am getting bites straight out. I'm going to get bites from the, from the get-go here on these small hooks. For me, unbelievable lack of gear. I might want a slightly bigger piece of crab meat. Now I've gone out a little bit farther out there and I'm not getting quite so many bites as I did dropping down the side. So I'm going to bring it up and just drop it straight down the edge. It's not very deep, six, eight feet. This is low water, so possibly not a good time for fishing, I don't know. Now this is pier fishing. If you have small hooks, small baits, small leads, just barely enough to hold the bottom, you can come down. Wife, wife and the daughter are off shopping again, and I'm salvaging something for the day by at least catching the odd fish or two. Apparently by the kelp on here, this is the uh, lower end of the jetty that gets covered. So you can see the rise and fall there. And the fact, if you look there, you can see a slip of limpet, loads of barnacles on there. So this does actually come up a long way this tide. I'm gonna drop this one down by the side of the pilings there. They've got a bit of surge from the tide, so it might get snagged up. It's more than likely going to be where the rats are, straight down the side of the piling. So bait is peeler crab just taking the legs off it. Got the main claw here, just going to just crush it enough to peel up and break off like this. So you can see the meat and then you don't want to snap it in half you can because there's quite a bit of meat on these claws, especially when you're fishing for small fish like this. Anything really. trying to keep that as I put a bit, bit bigger bait on there. Just ease that meat out of there. You can see if I snap this in half I've got a couple of decent baits there. Very very small hook. Let me pull that piece of meat off. You can see just a small small hook. About a size 10 fresh water but a long shank and you want to make sure it covers the hook, but the hook point comes through. I'm going to put that other piece of meat on there as well. See, that's a long shank hook, it's, a, it's easier for catching live baits. Because it's easier to unhook that way you don't damage a live bait quite so much. Let's get it down there, boys. All right, bites again, guys. This one is a different species. One of those sort of pouting bite. There are three different species here. It's not quite a, a pork, or it is a small pouting there. Very, very good. For, if you fish out live for bass or dead for conga, we're going to chuck him back. Three different species. I've only been here five minutes. We're going a little bit further out this time. The secret is to try and just fill the lead barely on the bottom. I've just barely got enough lead to hold the bottom. Wind down and I'm fishing freshwater style with a line across my fingers here. So I can see a bite on the rod top or I can feel it through my fingers here. Got a bit quiet guys but still got one small one down here. Been catching these small pouting like this. 
So a bit of fun, but the girls are giving me a warning. They're on their last ice cream. So this guy's got to go back and I've got to get back. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to have one last session tonight. A little bit of fear, fun peer fishing though, light tackle. Just two small hooks like that. Light lead at the bottom. If you're down here on holiday, anywhere around the pier, give it a go. Well, that little bit of mini species bashing on the pier at least gave me something in the way of a few fish. It's just a fill-in. I've got one last night tonight, two and a half hours. High tide is around eight, it's now 10 past seven. I've got a little bit of bait left, one mackerel, couple of squid that Craig left me. He did good last night, I didn't get one bite. I could not buy a bite last night. So I'm pleased to get those mini species. Anyway, going to give it one more throw. It's not a very nice night. Another low pressure coming in. I'm going to get some baits out there. The weed is horrific. But hey ho, what do you do? When in Rome, as the saying goes. Let's get these baits out. I'm trying to keep this out of the wind, people, because it's, it's braying quite a bit. I'm trying to mimic Craig's length and size of bait here. They're not big baits, they're very compact. I'm using a rig, the up and over rig that he left me last night, on which I caught. That's right, nothing. And I've got a standard pulley rig on the other one. And I've made a mackerel and squid combo wrap, as per Craig, but... I don't have those uh, baiting tools, baiting needles. But we're gonna send this one out. Tide seems to be pulling hard. Jesus Christ. I've got weed or fish guys, one or the other. It's been out in minutes. I've got, I think I've got a big fish on this. It's going to be a nightmare. I hope to God I don't lose it. The freaking rod went over. I don't see it being weed. Maybe it's just weed. The thing flew out the rest. What the heck? No, I don't say it's just weed. I feel no kicks. Wouldn't it be sweet to get? To get one fish out of it. It's gone heavy now, it could be a fish. Wow. I don't know what happened there, the rod just went flying. It's gone solid. I reckon it's, oh, it's a fish. Oh man, it's a fish. It's a fish. Oh, God almighty, please stay on. Please stay on. It's on a single. Oh no, it's kicking. Oh, kicking fish, kicking fish, kicking. Oh, it's taking line. Oh God, alive! Where's Craig when you need him? Craig, mate, first frigging cast. I'm gonna drop this. I'm gonna drop this mic, guys. I'm gonna go in. Well, I'm not gonna go in. I drown. It's falling over! Man alive! Why was I deserving this one? A nice conger eel! Oh good god! The rod went flying out the rest! I've got to take a wrap on this one people! 
This is a nice conga. No wonder I nearly lost the rest. God damn it. He's eating a microphone cable. What do you think? Ah! Fresh as you like. I know it's flying around the camera, people. Uh, <laughs> it happened live on the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. A nice big conga reel. And you know what? I figure I was owed this one. Wowie. Just watched, I, I backed the drag on this kitty as well. I backed the drag on it and I still nearly lost the rod. Wackadoo. Great fish. Let's get it back. Jesus. I've just had steak and kidney pie, mashed peas, carrot, a pint of stag. I think most of it's about here. I hope it doesn't splash the lens if it comes up in excitement. There he is, that's all you're going to get. I'm going to sign off now and say thanks for watching the Tony Awesome Fishing Show. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button, hit that bell notification. Don't forget to watch Mike's TA Outdoors. We'll see you next time. You might even see me on this time because I am staying late. Woohoo! Well, people, let's put that camera up a bit for you. That's the first time I've ever had that happen. I'm talking to you, getting ready for cast the rod out. The rod just went flying out the rest. Now, I've told you before about putting weight to the back of the tripod, and I, <laughs> I've got to follow my own instructions, haven't I? I had the lucky awesome hat on, so I had the luck with me. It went crashing down. All you've got to watch is the stone hasn't fractured a piece of the glass or carbon if it's carbon i mean they're probably all glass so probably not so bad i mean god almighty it wasn't out there 60 seconds i should think the whole lot went the rod the tripod the lot so i've now down there got a heap of rocks i've piled up on the tripod i probably won't get i probably won't get another one but boy am i pleased to get jack conga good fight on it so lucky just hooked in there and it just goes to show you craig couldn't make it tonight my hunch was, as I said earlier on, we went right down there. Craig did okay. He's a shore guide. He knows the marks. I think he had two congas, two thornback rays. I just did a total, total blank. I think I lost one fish. Pulled off. But this mark here I had is that semicircle of sand that I could physically reach. And I marked it. I'm going to shield this mic by the big log there. So allowing for the wind to push down the right a bit. I reckon I'm still in with a chance. The tide has about... 20, 30 minutes to come up, then it's going to drop back. And allegedly, when it drops back, if I don't get hassled with a weed, I should be okay. I've got, a, I've got an outside shot at another fish. Anyway, look, result, I'm happy. Got one another one. I tried to copy Craig's size of bait and combo baits. I haven't got one of those double prong baiting tools, but I did lash squid and mackerel together and I put the meat on the outside or try to, whether it makes a difference, I don't know, but boy, I can't argue with the rod has been out 60 seconds or so. Ooh. Guy's got a big fish on, got a big fish, I've got to have to hold this in my mouth. I have to hold it, I can't. Ah, oh, he's still there. Lost him. Oh, you son of a bitch. Oh, no, he's still there, he's still there. He's still there. There he is. 
I've got the whole floodlight in my mouth. I hope when you guys are going to see some of this, <laughs> I can't even talk properly. Please, just one more. There's so much weed, it's unbelievable. <laughs> Come on, baby. <laughs> In you go. Oh, yeah, I see you. I'm getting on a wave, I'm getting on a wave. Where is he? Where the freaking hell is he? He's here, he's here. Oh, yeah, nice hill. Nice hill. Come, brother. Come on. Here he comes. Ah. Oh shit! <laughs> Look at this one, go! I speak English now. Look at this one. Oh man, I don't want a booty. A nice conga. Do you know what? I didn't even see the bite. They're in amongst that weed. Clean him up. Oh, he's heavy. He's... Oh, he's heavy. That one is a nice conga hill, boys. I don't know if you're going to see this. Look at that lovely blue in there. Wow. Look at Mr. Greedy looking up at his other rods. It's terrible us fishing, isn't it? Now, pliers here. I'm going to have to balance something somewhere. Hang on, guys. Got him out, boys. Got him out. He's coming down the cliff big time. Here you go. Well, he's got food in him as well, guys. This one. He's got a lot of food in him. We're going to get him in a right position. Watch out. There he goes. Go on. Oh, that's a nice big one. That is a nice big one, eh? It's got to be best of one, two, three, four feet. That should get him. There he goes. Beautiful. I'll get right in to the back of the net. Whew. Never give up. And I've got the hook back as well. I am majorly covered in slime. I'm on again. I'm on again. Torching them out. We're going to go down. Oh, I can't. It's kicking. Good fish. They say, oh, come on. Son of a bitch. That was son of a bitch, by the way. I'll keep the fresh on him. I don't know what you guys are getting. Oh, I think he's come off. What's he down here? Oh, I'm getting stuck back and getting off on a wave. He's in this weed somewhere. Small hill. Oh, number three. Number three. That's number three. <laughs> oh, man. Not as big as the others, but an eel. Great. Oh, oh a treasure. Friars. <laughs> I can't talk properly at the moment. Can't talk properly at the moment. Let's get this guy unhooked. There he is, guys. Hope you can see him. Another decent eel. I've no idea. I've not used this GoPro with this torch before, so I don't know what you're getting. You might get nothing. Three. Let's get this guy back. I've got to save the battery on the torch. So I'm absolutely on the last chargings on this. Thanks for watching the Totally Awesome Fishing Show. Once again, I've had a great time. 
I've enjoyed it this time. The wind is just freshening a little bit, it has gone down. Could have done without all that weaver. but listen, I've got three nice congreels. One was a, I don't know, small to medium, the other two are good ones, and I don't get many big beach congers. Wind's coming up, you'll probably hear it in the mic in a minute. I'm gonna pack up, it's nearly 11 o'clock, get back up there, a few hours sleep, hit the road home, and then, after editing this film, I'll be out there again. Don't forget, hit the subscription and notification button or bell on both channels, Totally Awesome Fishing Show, which is the best one on YouTube. Don't tell me it isn't, it is. And Mike's TA Outdoors, which he texted me tonight and said he's just gone past half a million subscribers. We'll see you guys next time.